Well, hey folks, Relaunch Super Joe Mithlins, Time for Wrestling to Piss Me Off Redux Part 18. As I said in the beginning of uh, Part 17, instead of waiting until September, I'm just going to record these now throughout the summer, just periodically, whenever I have time, <clears throat> or whenever I feel the need to make a video. Especially since I'm angered by the current WWE product, as of this recording especially. And, you know, I've done various rants about those, and you guys can go check out the past reviews if you'd like, whether they're solo or with myself and the Durbinator. But I figure I'm going to channel that anger and, that, and, you know, that frustration into a positive. The fans' frustration into a positive, and do more of these. Since everybody likes hearing about my angry, you know, hearing my views, and especially when it comes to things that anger me. <clears throat> so if you guys are familiar with the series, let's get cracking on with it. And if you're not, hey, it, it's about shit to piss me off. You know, the title says it all. I try to put the topics in the description, so if there's stuff that I haven't mentioned at all, please take a look at the description of every single video that I've done so far. I know it might take you a few minutes, but see if there's anything I haven't discussed, and if I haven't, especially by maybe the 19th or 20th installment that goes up, I will be happy to do a 21st, 22nd, whatever installment. You let me know, and if it's something that pissed me off, I will be happy to include it. Anyway, let's get cracking on with this. Hardcore Justice from TNA 2010. Sweet Christ, this was bad. This was really, really bad. Um, <clears throat> WWE's attempt at ECW was shit, by the way. I just want to say that much. I'm not knocking it because it's TNA with now Impact Wrestling, but it was TNA at the time for doing this. They had Tommy Dreamer. They had various others and everything. Foley was still part of the company at this point. Um, <clears throat> they had brought Raven back for a little bit. They had brought in some ECW originals. The problem is, is even in 2006, when WWE brought in the ECW originals, a lot of them were past their sell date. Sabu was past his sell date. Various others were past their sell date. Like, Balls Mahoney might have been the only one that was even in a little bit better shape. I mean, then RVD, but I'm sorry. I, I unpopular opinion on RVD. <clears throat> Maybe up before this, uh, before this goes up, or sometime shortly after. Because I got a lot to say about him. Not that I hate the guy as a person, but just people's perception of, oh, he's one of the greatest superstars of all time. No. But anyway, I'll, I'll get to that later. This was a bad idea all around because they didn't own the rights to any of the names. So unless the various wrestlers owned the rights to their own names, <clears throat> they either had to call them something different, completely change the gimmick, you know, tiptoe, not through the tulips, but around... All this stuff so they can get a trademark and, you know, trademark a strike or, in, you know, it wasn't infringing on a trademark that WWE owned because WWE owns a lot of the ECW shit. They had what? They didn't even have the blue meanie on it. Uh, meanie, I, I don't remember the reason why, but whatever. So they had one of the guys from that short-lived Team Phi Delta Slam play Blue Tilly, <clears throat> knock, uh, you know, a knockoff of the blue meanie in the... Uh, in the Blue World Order, and Stevie Richards, by the way, who didn't look like he fucking aged since the barely legal paper in 97, and that's not knocking Stevie Richards. The guy's in tremendous shape and should be at least a trainer in WWE. The guy could apply <coughs> some great training, you know, skills, some, you know, great knowledge. He could, you know, impart some great knowledge to the uh, younger wrestlers. But that's another story for another day. And actually, I may talk about Stevie Richards' usage in WWE because they should have used him a fucking lot better than they did. <clears throat> but the idea was, okay, they wanted to honor ECW. They had Tommy Dreamer there. They had various other wrestlers there. Okay. Hey, cool. Sandman, I think... San Sandman was just, like, super drunk. I think he appeared, actually, on the episode before. I don't actually recall if he appeared at this uh, show. And if he did, I don't think it was much of anything. Some of this shows like a bit of a blur to me because it was that bad. They had this weird goofy blue lighting. They censored the crowd when the crowd started saying the F word, which was bullshit. What the fuck is wrong with that? I don't know why I said the F word. I should have just said whenever they said the word fuck. <coughs> or shut the fuck up. or the... Which was odd because this was a pay-per-view. It was I could get it if it was like on Spike TV and Spike TV didn't want adult content, but maybe not that adult. This was on pay-per-view. Why'd they censor it on the DVD? Did they censor it on a live pay-per-view? I don't recall if I actually ordered this pay-per-view or not. But it was stupid. You had all these ECW guys, and look, I get it, it was a way to honor ECW. I get it. And I'm not I'm not even knocking the original ECW, which had its fans and had a big following. And if Heyman had been a better money manager, it might have turned into what Ring of Honor is now. 
or at least for a number of years. I don't think ECW would still be alive today, but it would have lasted for a while. <coughs> but that being said, TNA's uh, venture into ECW land was doomed from the start. One, they had Sabu, who was just totally done. Dreamer wasn't in much better shape. And not knocking them, I mean, everybody in ECW generally beat their bodies to shit. Yeah, Team 3D. Um, it just, it was, it was just bad. It was just bad in general. Like, uh, like I said, most of the show was a blur to me. It was not very good at all. Like I said, the lighting was, the lighting was bad. It, I get that they wanted to try and leech a little more off the ECW product, or maybe honor it a little bit better than WWE did, which is fair because WWE's version of ECW was complete ass. <clears throat> but. This was not very good because, again, they didn't own any rights to the trademarks. They didn't own any rights to the music, to the names. I mean, think about it. You know, they couldn't be called the Deadly Boys. They had to be called Team 3D. Um, you know, the Blue Meanie, you know, Blue Tilly instead. Um, but, I mean, that was, a different, that was a different guy playing the character. But the whole idea is they were trying to honor ECW, and it was like a fraction of what ECW was. Now, I give them credit for <clears throat> having some, you know trying hard to honor the whole hardcore thing and they had raven versus dreamer and foley as a special guest referee and other people and stuff like that and whatever but it just they had al snow wrestling and al snow still still was in great shape still is in great shape now there there were there were good aspects of it <clears throat> but unfortunately by trying to copy another company it just didn't work. TNA the Bear copying ECW or honoring ECW during the TNA NWA TNA Asylum days, when they were in you know the uh, when they were in the little fairgrounds, when they had like Sandman and New Jack, two guys who could never wrestle for shit. But New Jack fucking scares me. Sandman doesn't necessarily scare me. I'm not saying Sandman isn't tough. I'm just saying he's stupid. He couldn't really wrestle. <clears throat> but. The original ECW had a lot of... I, I, look at my unpopular opinion on ECW if you want to get my full ideas, but I get why people like that. I don't get why they thought this was a good idea, and then they tried carrying it. It was called, not even ECW, EV 2.0, Extreme Violence 2.0, Extreme Version 2.0. I don't even remember the exact name of it. It wasn't really very interesting. They carried the storyline out, I think, until... It was either Lethal Lockdown of Bound for Glory 2010 or the pay-per-view very soon after. It was not <clears throat> the best idea in the world. Guys were not kept up under big kept under big contracts for very long. I think Sabu was gone really, really quick. Everybody was way past their cell date, and this shouldn't have happened. It just shouldn't have, because it made the pro even though it was much more adult than WWE's version of ECW, and that wasn't hard to do, this still wasn't good. Four something years later, and guys that had beaten their bodies to shit so much they couldn't go anymore. It just wasn't the best idea. Doing a reunion show isn't necessarily the worst thing, but when you are trying to revive something with guys that probably shouldn't even be in the ring anymore, it's a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> whether you're TNA, whether you're Ring of Honor, whether you're whatever. Bad idea. Anyway, now we go to another thing from TNA. Bound for Glory 2010. 10, 10, 10. They arrived. Who were they? It was Jeff Hardy turning heel, and then Jeff Jarrett joined the um, faction, and then was it Hogan and Bischoff? It was a whole takeover thing by Hogan and Bischoff because re reinvigorating the NWO was a good idea. It was not a good idea. It was a fucking terrible idea. And turning Jeff Hardy heel was a terrible idea. I'm not saying that Jeff can't play heel. I'm not saying he shouldn't have been. You know, he shouldn't have been given the chance to play a heel, but he was not in the right mindset at this point. He was not in the right mindset to be a TNA champion, <clears throat> to be the figurehead of the company, you know, to be the, you know, figured as the head of the company, you know, talent-wise. He did not represent the brand well, but he has since cleaned up his life. I'm not faulting him there. But look at what he did in the fallout. He swung a chair carelessly at Mr. Kennedy. And hit him in the back of the head, causing a concussion. Good job there, Jeff. Again, he has since apologized and cleaned up his life. It was not a good place at all. And you had Hogan. Hogan had just, I think, recently come off a of back surgery or a knee surgery or something like that. All I know is he was on crutches. And it was a three-way. And this was in the main event. <clears throat> the show itself was a pretty big mess. A pretty damn big mess. 
You had Joe and Jeff Jarrett versus Nash, Sting, and the Pope, D'Angelo De Niro, I think. I, I think he was there as part of it. Um, I don't know. Just Sorry, by the way, you know, if I sound a little off. I have allergies and everything. But yeah, this was like that. And then Jeff Jarrett walks out in Samoa Joe, so it's pretty damn obvious what was going to happen. And it was like, oh, they, they have arrived. It was a new faction and everything. It was terrible. It was just fucking awful. That led to Immortal. <clears throat> and Jeff Jarrett having that ass ugly belt that was created just for him. I mean, nothing wrong with trying to create a themed belt for somebody. They did with John Cena's spinner belt, you know, or WWE did years before. But that was an ugly ass belt. I mean, it represented, they say it represented change. Well, no, it was shit. But you had a main event, I think it was, it was Anderson, Angle, and Jeff Hardy. And when they arrived, <clears throat> Jeff Hardy, of course, took the crutch from Hogan and hit everybody with it, I think including some fans. No, he wasn't that crazy yet. But he gets the victory, and then, oh, they, it's you know, the beginning of Immortal and stuff like that. But Bound for Glory 2010 had a lot of hype behind it. And actually had some matches that led up to some really, really good things. The Bound for Glory series. That was really impressive. I really enjoyed that shit. They had a good build. They had some great matches in it. And then it was like a popcorn fart. Or a fart in church. It was just, it did not go over well. Because fans, <clears throat> one, did not want to boo Jeff Hardy. At all. They did not want to boo Jeff Hardy. Jeff Hardy was seen as, you know, a great, great, you know, a great, great champion. Somebody they wanted to see as champion. They turn him heel. And again, it could have worked if Jeff was in a better mindset and if they had a better storyline idea, but they didn't. It just turned into NWO on a different channel, only these guys were a lot older and not nearly worth what they were being paid. Especially Hogan. I think Hogan was getting, what, 300, I think if rumors are true, 350 grand, 400,000 a year. Why? You're paying your, ta you're paying your actual talent in the ring pennies on the dollar, and you're paying Hogan. Look, I get it. Hogan's got name value. I get that. Okay, I get it. Hogan's one of the biggest draws of all time. For better or worse, one of the biggest draws of all time. <clears throat> had some big matches, big feuds. Sure, he held some people down. Sure, there were people that got over because of Hogan. And sometimes there were very few people that got over on Hogan without shenanigans. But there was a lot of good that came because of the business. The business did swell up. It did. Because of the machine and because of Vince McMahon and a whole lot of stuff and yada, yada, yada. But Hogan in 2010 with all those back surgeries and with all the fact that he couldn't really wrestle anymore, I think he wrestled like three, four matches in his entire TNA run, which he shouldn't have even wrestled one. <clears throat> and I did rant about um, the match he had with Sting at the next Bound for Glory, 2011, which was abysmal. Not that I expected to be anything, but... Back to the 2010 Bound for Glory, it just was a mess. And it shouldn't have been. There should have been, it should have been a landmark achievement. They should have had a storyline that carried them on for a number of months, even a year. And it was crap. It was just NWO on a different channel, all these old guys and stuff like that. It was like trying to recreate the main event mafia. Or even trying to re maybe recreate evolution a little bit. Or the NWO, you have older guys and you have some younger guys. And none of the younger guys got over because of it. I think Bully Ray might have been the only one. I think he was an immortal for a little bit. He was the only one that even succeeded much outside of it. I mean, Gunner, which I feel bad for Gunner, because Gunner's actually really talented, um, <clears throat> despite the chances he was sort of given. But there weren't a lot of people that really benefited from it. It just wasn't worth much of anything. Like, take, take a look back at the stuff with Immortal. It wasn't really all that good. And it wouldn't have been good if it was in WWE, by the way. I'm not just trying to say that, oh, T it was only because of TNA. No, it wouldn't have been good if it was in anything else, because it was rotten. Yeah, Bound for Glory 2010 should have been the big, big launching point for them. 2008, 2000, well, 2007, 8, 9 were pretty good Bound for Glory, especially 07. 07 was tremendous. I actually did a 10-year reflection on that if you want to check those check out that uh, pay-per-view list or that, you know, show list. I really did enjoy talking about that one because it was pretty damn good. But now we go to another thing, the Diva Search. The Diva Search was shit. They give us some women out of it. Maria Canellas came out of it. Layla. I believe Michelle McCool. Christy Hemi. And, and Hemi tried and 
had since done some great things. It wasn't her fault. She wasn't very good in the ring. They rushed her too quick. She was a good ring announcer in <clears throat> Impact Wrestling. And of course, they had that whole you know incident with her and Aries, which if you haven't seen it, you know, check it out on YouTube. He kind of he kind of goes balls to the wall, aka her face in the in one entrance, which whatever. I'm, I I don't I don't know what that was about, but. Hemi did try wrestling in, in uh, Impact and actually would have would have succeeded more, but she suffered a neck injury, decided not to get back in the ring, did have surgery, decided not to get back in the ring. Quality of life, good for her. I believe she's had kids since. I can't remember if it was twins or even quadruplets, but good for her. But the Diva Search gave us some women. I mean, Layla might be my favorite out of all of them. I mean, Marie, there was Marie Canellis, but by and large, it was ass. You did have Ashley Mazzaro in it, and nothing against Ashley Mazzaro as a person. They should have never had her in the ring. Or if they had her in the ring, they should have given her way more time to get better. <clears throat> because she was out there either injured or just not knowing what the fuck she was doing. And yeah, they did. I think there were even rumors like what, during the network, like the early network days that were going to bring the Diva Search back. And I don't think they ever did. Or if they did, it had no buzz behind it at all. The Diva Search had some good ideas, and yes, there were a few women that that came from it. I want to say Candace Michelle came from it, and she did okay. You know, all things considered, unfortunately, in, the injury bug bit her and didn't let go later in her career. There were some women that came from it <coughs> that had good careers, so to speak. But by and large, it was just shit where you're just basically shitting on the current women and everything and oh yeah we have these great women's wrestlers we're gonna get these women they're essentially models i mean some of them tried and some of them did well some of them weren't very good um kelly kelly i mean i don't think kelly kelly was part of the diva search she just wasn't very good in general but yeah the diva search has turned out to be complete shit overall turned out to be complete shit if these women got to live there, the women that, you know, actually did good and just weren't there for a paycheck actually lo learned to love the business and did well. If they <coughs> had, you know, got to got to live their dream, that's great. There were some that were shit. And I'm going to just take a look through the um, names that were, that were part of it, and you might recognize some of them as being shit. But anyway, now I'm going to finish off with the cat, Jerry Lawler's ex-wife. Never belonged in the business. Had no respect for it, seemingly, and was just a, a pretty face. I mean, I guess I never found her attractive. I haven't been hit in the head with a brick that much to find her attractive. You guys found her attractive, great. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, Lawler liked her because she was young and <clears throat> impressionable, and because Lawler's a bit of a creep. Okay, he's a major creep. That's another story for another day. But yeah, the cat. I mean, they had what her and China as a team. I think the cat was like her little protege, or submissive, or whatever they were trying to go with. It was a little bit odd, but it is what it is. But she, I don't. I, I'm sorry. I just, I never understood why she had TV time. I mean, obviously, besides being married to the king, she just what she wasn't worth the TV time she got. She wasn't. She didn't. She didn't seem to respect the business. She wasn't any good in the ring. I mean, she never needed to be good in the ring. If they had her as a valet, it would have been fine. But for all TV time she had, she was rotten. She was absolutely rotten. So that's where I'm going to finish that off. So, do you agree? Do you disagree with what I said? Like, share, comment, subscribe. Twitter link in the description. It's been Real Honesty with John Ripplin, and I will see you soon.